Please open your Bibles with me to Ephesians chapter 6, if you will. I want to thank our, our praise band, our worship guys. Man, don't they do a good job? Yeah. You know, I, I was encouraged this morning in worship, particularly by the verse, Christ has already regarded my hopeless estate. I'm feeling that this morning. <laughs> That's a good place to start. It's the beginning of a new year, uh, the beginning of a new season for all of us. But just from the everyday conversations I've had with people kind of here and there in the community, I believe this year more than ever, many of us are looking for a fresh start in 2023. I mean, if life runs in seasons, and I believe it does, many of us have been through a very long, very difficult season in life. And we're ready to reboot. We want to unplug and, and plug back in again 10 seconds later. We want to wipe the slate clean, kind of start over fresh and new. So I truly hope that you are excited about the coming year. I believe there are many, many blessings that are going to come our way through our lives in Christ and through our life in this church. I mean, after all, we really do have the benefit of experiencing what Scripture calls an abundant life right now because of what Jesus has already done for us. And I trust that we all share in the hope, the certain expectation, that one day very soon, Jesus Christ is going to come back for his church. I believe he is. As believers, as followers of Jesus, I think it's, it's just right for us to live in anticipation of those things and to be excited about those things. So I've always considered myself as kind of a positive person, a glass half full kind of guy. But I've recently discovered, at least in my life, as I have aged, and I'm doing that, which is weird, <laughs> it creates this kind of tension between optimism and realism. Anybody relate to that? <laughs> so along with the blessings we're expecting, I feel like I'd be remiss, especially in the climate and the culture that we live in today, if I didn't mention that we should also expect our fair share of challenges and difficulties in the coming year. After all, Jesus forewarned us here on earth, you will have many trials and sorrows. I've heard it said one of the ironies of walking with Jesus is that many of life's blessings come through the battles. Do I agree with that? Absolutely I do. Man, I couldn't agree more. I mean, that's been my experience. It's often been through the, the challenging times, the difficult times that I've grown and I've changed and I've still got a long way to go, but I'm becoming more like Jesus. It's sanctification. God designed it. That's the way it works. And so as we enter 2023, it's important that you and I, I would say it's a good thing and a, a godly thing for us to be optimistic about what lies ahead. As long as we're willing to balance that optimism with the fact that we, we do have a real enemy in this world. You know that, right? And his primary objective is to separate us from God and to destroy everything that's good in our lives. That's what he does. See, in our best efforts to use the power of positive thinking or to take steps toward our best life now, we have to remember our enemy has a long and documented history 
of attacking God's people. You'll remember Satan's brutal attack on Job. Job was a very godly and a very wealthy man. The enemy took away everything. The devil took David, God's chosen king for his own special people, down a path of adultery and then murder to cover up the adultery. Satan stood in the presence of angels to accuse Joshua, the Lord's high priest. And he even accused the perfect man, the Lord Jesus himself. So I think we, I think you and I, would be foolish to think that we're above or beyond the enemy's tactics. And it's in that context, the challenges we face in life, the attacks of the enemy that come into our path, the difficulties that we experience, that I want to share with you this morning a message from God's Word really under the heading of spiritual warfare. But more specifically, it's a, it's a message about preparing for battle because we all face battles. And it's told from a very unique perspective. And, and first and foremost, the perspective is biblical, right? I mean, you're at Coastline, you know that. Pastor Chuck Smith said, we simply teach the Bible simply. So that's what we do here. We just teach God's Word. I mean, it's been my privilege here at Coastline to serve under and, and learn from two men of God who basically have committed themselves to simply teach God's Word and to let everything else revolve around that. It's rare in our world today. It really is. But I also want you to hear it from the perspective that I heard it from about spiritual warfare. I want you to hear it from a soldier's perspective. So here's the deal. And some of the guys know where I'm going right now. In October of last year, we had a men's conference. And it was under the theme of the battle belongs to the Lord. And while the Bible teaching, the worship, the testimonies that we had, the food, fellowship, and games. Man, those things were all great. They were way above par. It was the workshops that were presented by two military combat veterans that forever changed my perspective on spiritual warfare. So that's kind of where we're going this morning. And here's what I hope you'll take away with you today. Just three things. First, we have a mission. There's an end game that you and I are part of as followers of Jesus Christ. We need to know what our mission is, and we need to implement that mission in our lives starting today. We need to get busy with it. Next, we have a command structure that is very different from the command structure of this world because our commander is very different from this world. And then through the spiritual application, and I emphasize that, spiritual application of some military tactics, you and I can better prepare ourselves for the challenges, the difficulties, and the battles that lie ahead of us this year or in the years to come. So if I were to put the message into three baskets, it would be this. Mission, command structure, and preparation. Mission, command structure, and preparation. And ladies, here's my disclaimer to you. This message is kind of embedded with a lot of military terms just because of what it is. You're going to hear about battles and warfare. I'm going to mention commanders and tactics a lot, but it's no less applicable to you in the spiritual sense, in the spiritual realm. And I'll do my best to, to make that clear as we go along. So let me pray for our time together this morning, and we're going to jump right into God's Word. Father God, we thank you today for a new year, a new season. 
And Lord, for the fact that you can and do make all things new. Now, just for that one thing, Lord, that kindness toward your kids, we thank you this morning. You're so worthy of our praise and our worship. And so we do that. We worship you together. You're our mighty God who promises us a new life and an abundant life in Jesus Christ, our Savior. And Lord, we invite you this morning as we gather to speak to us. Speak to your men and to your women through your word about being soldiers in your army in the coming year. We pray that you would prepare us for the battles that we're going to face. Give us the tools that we need to fight and to fight well. Lord, to survive and to be overcomers in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So, mission, command structure, preparation. You got that, right? Okay. And, of course, those are all based on the instructions or rules of engagement that we get from God's Word. So, again, join me, if you will, in Ephesians chapter 6. Uh, the two primary texts are from Ephesians 6 and 2 Chronicles chapter 20. Uh, we'll be jumping over there in just a minute. But first, Ephesians 6, and I'll begin reading in verse 10, where Paul says this, A final word, be strong in the Lord and in the power of His might. Put on all of God's armor so that you'll be able to stand firm against the strategies of the devil. For we're not fighting against flesh and blood enemies, but against evil rulers and authorities of the unseen world, against mighty powers in this dark world, and against evil spirits in heavenly places. Therefore, put on every piece of God's armor so you will be able to resist the enemy in the time of evil. Then after the battle, you will still be standing firm. Stand your ground, putting on the belt of truth and the body armor of God's righteousness. For shoes put on the peace that comes from the good news so that you'll be fully prepared. In addition to all of these, hold up the shield of faith to stop the fiery darts of the devil. Put on salvation as your helmet and take the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Pray in the Spirit at all times and on every occasion. Stay alert and be persistent in your prayers for all believers everywhere. And then flip back to 2 Chronicles chapter 20. So if you look at your Bible and you divide it in thirds, it's, it's about the one-third mark is where you'll find 2 Chronicles. It's there following Joshua, Samuel, and King. So 2 Chronicles chapter 20, verse 15. If you're there, say the battle belongs to the Lord. Good, you're there. This is what the Lord says. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged by this mighty army. For the battle is not yours, but God's. You know, I've always had a huge respect for the men and women who are serving or who have served in our United States Armed Forces. I've mentioned in the past that my father was a combat veteran, a paratrooper in the latter part of World War II. Uh, my son served in the United States Coast Guard. But my respect reached a whole new level after hearing our two military experts speak at the men's retreat last year. The first guy who spoke, and he spoke on preparation for battle, was a gentleman named Jake Ray. He attends Coastline Navarre. And Jake was a staff sergeant in the United States Army who served as an infantry airman, more commonly known as a paratrooper. He did what my dad did in the Army. He spent over two years in Iraq with over 400 combat missions in his first 15 months of deployment. Now, you do the math. I mean, that's, that's like one a day, close to it. He also served as an infantry drillman 
for two years, and those guys are responsible for taking guys off the street, guys like me, and turning them into soldiers, guys that are prepared for ground warfare. So this guy, Jake, he knows how to prepare for battle. He's got it down. And I want to share with you what I learned from him. See, before going into battle, Jake said there are four things every soldier must know to consider himself mission ready. Again, I'll be using some military terms for military preparations, but what we're looking for, what I hope we can come to terms with, is the spiritual application this morning. And the first thing you have to know to adequately prepare for battle is that end goal that I mentioned earlier. What is it that makes this operation a win? What's the objective? In military terminology, what's the mission? See, for soldiers, the mission, the military objective must be known and communicated with great clarity to bring about success. Now, for you and I, as followers of Jesus Christ, our mission has been clearly communicated, and it never changes. That's good for guys like me. I need that. Jesus himself, our commander-in-chief, said, I've been given all authority in heaven and on earth. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Teach these new disciples all the commands I have given you, and be sure of this. I am with you always, even to the end of the age. See, that's our mission. That's our goal. Jesus clearly spells it out to you and I through his word. But what's that mean in the doing of it? It means that we go. We don't wait around. We don't stand by. We don't hang or chill, as my 23-year-old son would say. We follow the words that come from the very top of our organizational structure, the commander of the Lord's army, and we go. And what do we do when we go? Well, Jesus gives us that answer. He says, we make disciples, we baptize them, we teach them. So that's what we do. We go and we make disciples, we baptize people, and, and we teach people. Nothing could be more clear. Then Jesus adds, he says, be sure of this, because I think Jesus knew we needed to be sure of this. I am with you always, even to the end of the age. See, Jesus didn't give us some vague, complicated mission to carry out, dependent upon our skills or our set of abilities. He gave us a very clear, very simple mission, along with his authority and his presence to carry it out. Now, knowing, embracing, and applying that mission is our first step in preparing for battle. It's the foundation of everything else that comes after it. So what do we do first? It rhymes with Joe. We go, right? That, that was for Pastor Neil. Yeah. We, <laughs> Joe, go. Yeah. And then what do we do? Well, we, we make disciples. We baptize them. We've got a baptism coming up in one of the services very, very soon. And then we teach them. And, and you know we teach God's Word here at Coastline. It's what we do. That's our mission. And we need to keep our mind on the mission and the mission on our mind. We need to do that. The second step in preparation for battle is understanding the command structure. Now, see, we need to understand it because it's different from the rest of the world. It's different than those you rub shoulders with out there. The command structure is different because we serve a different commander. We have someone that we're under the authority of. 
Military commanders are are typically the brains behind the battle. They're the guys that are analyzing information. They're strategizing. They're developing. They're solidifying the plans of battle, far removed from the front lines in most cases. But as we just learned, Jesus is with us in the battle. Be sure of this, Jesus said. In Deuteronomy 31.8, Moses encouraging his successor to be, Joshua. He said, the Lord himself goes before you and will be with you. He'll never leave you. He'll never forsake you. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. Man, if the Lord is going ahead of us, why would we be? Our commander-in-chief is not in Washington, D.C., in a closed-door meeting, kind of meeting with his top advisors. He's not secluded in a bunker somewhere, secluded far from the front lines. Here's what we need to understand about our commander as we're going into spiritual battles. Jesus is right beside us. He's right there with us, encouraging us and fighting with us. And he's protecting us. Scripture says he'll even fight our battles for us if we'll let him do that. See, we truly do serve an uncommon commander. So in preparing for the battles ahead, Jake Ray taught me first, we need to know the mission. Second, we need to know the command structure. And then the third step, and this is a big one, is we need to perform a mission analysis. Now, I tried not to use a lot of military abbreviations. I think that was probably just for me. I tend to get lost in the, the military terminology. But this is one of the exceptions. The steps in a mission analysis can be remembered by the letters METTC. M-E-T-T dash T-C. And it's not really an abbreviation. It's called a mnemonic. It's a pattern of letters that are designed to help you remember something. And the United States military, they're champions at mnemonics. They've got them. So the mission analysis part of the battle preparation includes six different components Six different components that are represented by these letters in METTTC, METTC. So the purpose of the mission analysis is to make sure every aspect of the mission has been thoroughly considered. It's been gone through. And it also lays the groundwork for the fourth step, which are the pre-combat checks and inspections. We'll get to those in a sec. Please stay with me, because I'm going to be moving really quickly through this. There's, there are several that we have to cover, and we're looking for the biblical application. So the first letter in METTC, it's M, and it stands for mission. And our mission is to go. It's to go. And when we go, we do what? Well, we make disciples. We baptize them, and we teach them. And we do all of that under the authority and in the presence of who? Jesus Christ. Yeah, he's our captain. He's our commander. And if you missed any of that, go back and review it. Matthew 20, 18 through 20 gives you every bit of that. So that's all on the M. E is for enemy. In the art of warfare. An ancient Chinese military writing, military general and strategist Sun Tzu said this, If you know the enemy and you know yourself, you need not fear the results of a hundred battles. But here's what's interesting. Not only do American Christians not know their enemy, many of them don't even believe he exists. The Barna Organization is a research organization that kind of specializes in bridging the gap between faith and culture, the intersection of those two. And they say that only about 35% of Christians in America today believe that we have a real enemy in spite of what the Bible says. 
That's crazy to me. I mean, the Bible declares that the devil is real, that he is the ruler of this world, a spirit creature who became wicked and then rebelled against God. And the Bible goes on to reveal the devil's personality through several names and descriptions. Satan, which means resistor in Job 1.6. Devil, which means slanderer in Revelation 12.9. Serpent, which is used in the Bible to mean deceiver, 2 Corinthians 11.3. Tempter in Matthew 4.3. And liar in John 8.3. 44. We have a real enemy, guys. And to win the battle, we need to know who the enemy is. I mean, Satan is the universe's public enemy number one. He's the chief opponent of God and his people, you and I. And he's the leader of a vast number of demonic forces. He's not out there by himself. Jesus said our enemy has been a murderer from the beginning, and he's engaged in an all-out war against the forces of good in the world. And his primary target, please listen, know this about your enemy. His primary target is your relationship with Jesus Christ. Pastor John, just last week, in talking about this demon-possessed man in Luke 8, said, We all have a spiritual enemy who has come to steal, kill, and destroy. Satan was very real to that guy. Our enemy specializes in ripping off anyone who follows Jesus. He's become very, very good at it. So, please, let me ask you, don't leave here today thinking that the devil is a mythical creature, some kind of a cartoon character, or a figment of someone's imagination. He's not. You've heard this often, God has a plan for your life. But please believe me when I tell you, so does this very real former angel named Satan. He has a plan for your life too. The first T in our mission analysis is for terrain. It's the battlefield and, and what's around you in the battle. It's been said that a lack of environmental awareness can lead to dire consequences. And military training includes an, an assessment of areas of operation for things like observation posts and fields of fire, cover and concealment obstacles, key or decisive terrain features, and avenues of approach. But what does it mean for you and I from a spiritual viewpoint? You know, I'd, I'd be happy if you just remember this. Where you are is important. Where you place yourselves is critically important. See, we need to develop a spiritual environmental awareness that helps us to stay in those areas where we're most likely to thrive and to avoid the areas that suck the spiritual life out of us. There are those areas. Avoid those areas that are filled with tempt temptation and that tempt you to give in to your weaknesses. Samson, a man of great strength and position, during the time of the judges, sealed his fate as a Philistine slave by repeatedly exposing himself to a hostile environment that was rich with Philistine soldiers and Philistine women. That's kind of where he lived, and it was a bad place for him to live. Gideon, another prominent judge in the history of Israel, once referred to by an angel as a mighty man of valor, will be remembered as a man who fell prey to the luxuries of success, riches, and prominence. That's where he ended up. See, to prepare for battle, we have to be honest and evaluate our environmental weaknesses. 
Why do we do that? Well, I would say because the enemy already has. He's already looked at you. You know, we can learn something very important from our enemy or about our enemy from the short conversation that he had with God in the book of Job. From Job chapter 1, I want to read this for you. Then the Lord asked Satan, Have you noticed my servant Job? He is the finest man in all the earth. He's blameless, a man of complete integrity. He fears God and stays away from evil. Satan replied to the Lord, Yes, but Job has good reason to fear God. You've always put a wall of protection around him and his home and his property. You've made him prosper in everything he does. Look how rich he is. And here's what I want you to see. Satan doesn't just know Job's name. He knows about the intimacies of Job's life, up to and including the details of his relationship with the Lord. And listen, please stay with me. Satan also knows your name. He knows my name. That's why Peter encouraged us to stay late, stay, stay alert. Uh, watch out for your great enemy, the devil. He prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. And while he's prowling, while the enemy is kind of looking around, He's assessing where we're weak. He's taking a look at the obstacles that he can use to compromise us. James, the half-brother of Jesus, said, Resist the devil and he will flee. But if you read that verse in its context, part of resisting the devil is humbling ourselves before God and being honest about the places and the things the environments and the obstacles that could cause us to stumble. We need to consider that. We need to pray about that. The second T is for troops. In military terminology, this analysis is about the availability, the quantity, the training, and the readiness of soldiers. And it's much the same on the spiritual battlefield. First, who's available? Who are you going to call? It's who's going to pick up the phone and respond to your text? Or who's going to show up when you need someone, when you're going through one of life's crises? And are they trained and ready when it comes to spiritual matters? Many of you know Pastor Fidel Gomez. Pastor Fidel has spoken here on numerous occasions over the year. He's from Fort Lauderdale. And, and Pastor Fidel spoke this into my life five or six years ago. I'm a little embarrassed to tell you that because it, it, it just now kind of sunk in. I'm just getting there after five or six years. It doesn't happen overnight. But I've got a group of men, many of them will be in the services here this morning, that will show up when I call, without a doubt. Man, those guys will be there. And many times, it'll be a great sacrifice to them personally. And I do the same for them. Let me encourage you. We need those kinds of relationships if we're going to survive the coming year. We need to be closer to people than we ever have men and women of God. And I'm going to be brutally honest about this because it's, it's really that important in my mind today. If you haven't surrounded yourself with some people who are useful on the spiritual battlefield, who have the training and the readiness to enter this specific type of conflict, man, you may be surrounding yourself with the wrong people. You need some spiritual giants around you, some men and women of God. At Coastline, we often say we're better together, and we are. But we're better together not because we can trust each other, but because together we can trust Him. We can trust Him. It's a bond that we share. 
that's based on our Savior, Jesus Christ. See, it was Jesus who said, I will guide you along the best pathway for your life. I will advise you, and I'll watch over you. It's Jesus who makes us better together. Moses had his judges. David had his mighty men. Jesus, God in the flesh, had his disciples. How much more should we surround ourselves with godly people? I mean, if we're to overcome this great foe, this enemy that we have, and win the battles that we face day in and day out, we need to surround ourselves with Jesus people. We need people of Jesus in our life. And that's why the local church and that's why small groups are so important to you. They give you the avenue to connect with one another in a much deeper way. I mean, where else in this world are you going to find the concentration and the diversification of believers that you find in the local church? It's just not going to happen anywhere else. And listen, I know sometimes isolation can become a very comfortable place. We all have those times. I would say we all have those seasons when we just need to pull away from all these people. I'm okay, it's just Jesus and me. But you can't be pro-Jesus and anti-church. I mean, think about that. Jesus built the church. He loves the church. Jesus gave his life for the church. And I would say on the battlefield, a lifestyle of isolation makes you an easy target for the enemy. You need your troops, people who are available, people who are trained, people who are ready to show up for you and to help you wherever you find yourself. The third T in our mission analysis is time, which we're running through very rapidly, so I'm going to speed up a little bit. In military operations, every effort is made to define the time element. Every movement is planned to the minute. Every mission is a coordinated effort. Our spiritual battles, they're current and they're constant. They're now and they're always If we were completely honest and transparent this morning with each other, I think with very few exceptions, everyone in this room would say, yes, I'm involved in some kind of spiritual conflict right now. And the rest just don't know it yet. You'll get there. (laughs) I know, I've had the opportunity to sit down with some of you that are suffering right now. I mean, you've got health issues. You've got family concerns. The job's not going well. Everything in the world is changing, and you're a rut person just like I am. You don't want it to change. And listen, we think it will never end, but our enemy knows differently. More than anyone else, Satan knows that the world is not falling apart Jesus is bringing all things together. He's doing that right now. The end is not only an absolute certainty, but according to Scripture, read Revelation 19, it happens in an instant. And I would tell you this morning the clock is ticking. It is. And the last letter in this mnemonic, METTC, stands for Civilian Considerations. For the military application, this analysis is included to determine how soldiers will interact or handle situations that involve civilians. For you and I, I think it's how the spiritual battle we're engaged in affects those around us, because it does. It's maintaining our identity in Christ, staying true to who we really are, even in the most trying circumstances. And it's even being other-centered where we're consumed by all that's going on in our own life. It's hard. 
I love this quote from former President Abraham Lincoln. He said, be sure your feet are standing in the right place, then stand. Sound familiar? Man, in Ephesians 6, Paul said it this way. He said, put on all the armor of God, verse 11, so that you will be able to stand firm against the strategies of the devil. And again in verse 13, therefore put on every piece of God's armor so you'll be able to stand against the enemy in the time of evil. Then after the battle, you will still be standing firm. It's standing on the rock of our salvation. It's standing on Jesus Christ. Because it's in Him that we find out who we are. You've heard this before. Our identity in Christ, we're forgiven. We're free. We have a family. We have a future in store for us. These are indisputable truths and not subject to the circumstances of whatever our present battle is. It's who we are, church. It's the way we stand. We follow the examples established by our commander, Jesus Christ, that govern our relationships. Pastor Neil once said it this way, we one another, one another. All those one another statements in Scripture, they're there for a reason. That's, that's what we do. We're kind, we're courteous, we're loving, we're considerate to those around us. Not because we feel like it or because we're unaffected by the battle, but because of His Spirit within us. We have His Holy Spirit within us. The Holy Spirit gives us the ability and the power to be like Jesus in spite of our circumstances. And we put others above ourselves because that's the pattern that He set. That's the standard that we've been called to. We don't have to be like Jesus. We get to be like Jesus. That's how we stand. And there's no such thing as collateral damage because we care for those around us. We love those around us just like He did. So we've talked about our mission, our command structure. We've talked about our preparation. But for those in the military, you're not considered to be mission ready until the pre-combat checks and the pre-combat inspections are completed. And this is where the soldier checks everything in minute detail and everything is checked again by his commander. And I think it's such a beautiful picture of the ebb and flow in prayer and how that prepares us for our battles. Spiritually, it's you and I checking ourselves against the benchmarks that we've been given in Scripture. But it's also trusting the Lord to inspect what we've done and to prepare us in a very unique way because He and only He knows exactly what we're up against. How do we do it? Well, we do it one-on-one, -on -one, communicating with our, our Lord, our Savior, our Commander-in-Chief. And listen, the information on prayer and spiritual warfare, it's endless. It would take me uh, uh, another message or, or five, I don't know. It's a lot. But with just a couple of minutes remaining, let me leave you with this. This is very important. It's in an attitude of prayer that we go through kind of our resource list, those things that are available to us in Christ. And these resources are named very clearly for us in Ephesians 6, beginning with verse 14. First of all, the belt of truth. Sanctify them with your truth. Your word is truth, is what Jesus said. See, this belt, this truth, the word of God holds everything together. It's, it's the core. If you want to know more about core training, man, talk to a, an elite athlete. They know all about it. They know about the importance of it. We put on the breastplate of righteousness, and that righteousness, it's not ours. 
It belongs to Jesus. Jesus, taking our sins upon himself, gave us his righteousness as a breastplate, as a critical piece of armor that protects us and protects all that's vital about us. We put on the shoes represented here by the gospel of peace. This is our uncompromising foundation. The Bible says, For the word of the cross is folly to those who are perishing, but to those who are being saved, it's the power of God. The shield of faith is an interesting weapon. It's both defensive to stop the fiery darts of the devil, but it's also offensive to knock down strongholds. But the benefits of the shield are fully recognized as we lock them together, forming an impenetrable wall for the enemy. If you haven't seen the movie 300, watch it. You'll, you'll get the whole shield thing through that. We're told to put on the helmet of salvation. The helmet protects the believer's mind in spiritual battle. I don't know about you, but my mind needs protecting. The helmet is salvation. And it reminds us that no matter what happens to us on any given day, we're still going to heaven. And I take comfort in that. The sword of the Spirit is our greatest offensive weapon. And, and without a weapon, a soldier's only hope is for survival. And that hope's not very good. And finally, pray in the Spirit at all times and on every occasion. Listen, prayer, it's listed last, but not because it's an afterthought. It's the thought. It's the one-on-one -on -one connection, the one-on-one -on -one communication with God about all of the other preparations that we make. And it ensures that you and I are ready to fight and to win. Now, I know that's a lot of information to process. But if you just remembered one thing from this morning, please remember this. We don't fight our battles alone. We're not wired to do it that way. We fight them in the presence and the power of our Savior, Jesus Christ. And we fight them with the men and women that God surrounds us with, those people He brings into our lives that are godly. Our battles belong to the Lord. 